afternoon or good evening or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the Center for Governance and Markets. Uh, this is our speaker series on coexistence in pluralistic societies. I'm Jennifer Murtazashvili, the director of the center, and it is a huge delight to welcome two esteemed colleagues who are going to discuss the virtues of capitalism today. Uh, the, the topic of our discussion is really to, to launch a very impressive book called Possessive Individualism by Professor Dan Bromley. And Professor Bromley is the Anderson Bascom Emeritus Professor of Applied Economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's a fellow of the Association of Environmental and Resource Economics and of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association. In 2012, he received the Reimar Lust Prize from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And he's written, I think this is your 16th book, Professor, um, that explores processes of institutional change. He's made substantial contributions to public policy as well, having served as chair of the Federal Advisory Committee on Marine Protected Areas, including many others. And his research concerns the institutional foundations of economic systems. And so responding to Professor Bromley today, we have Professor Mark Pennington, who's a professor of political economy and public policy in the Department of Political Economy at King's College in London. He's currently the director of the Center for the Study of Governance and Society there. His work takes place at the intersection of philosophy, politics, and economics, with a particular focus on exploring problems of limited knowledge or bounded rationality and their relationship to ideal or non-ideal theorizing in economics and political theory. And this approach was exemplified in his 2011 book, Robust Political Economy, Classical Liberalism, and the Future of Public Policy. It's already a classic. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce, uh, I'll allow Professor Bromley to take the stage. And I just want to encourage our audience uh, to let you all know that um, you should uh, include your questions. There'll be time for Q&A after our uh, presenters uh, speak today. And if, if you have questions at any point, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll make sure that we get to them during the course of our conversation. So without further ado, Professor Bromley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen, for this opportunity to visit about my recent book, Possessive Individualism, A Crisis of Capitalism. Those of us who write books do so in order that we might learn something. We want to teach ourselves about surprising events out in the world. It's a diagnostic undertaking. We call it abduction. It is the act of drawing inferences that might lead to possible reasons for surprising phenomena. The origin of my puzzlement can be placed in late 2009, just as the world was emerging from the Great Recession. I was teaching at Humboldt University in Berlin and was invited to give the annual Helmholtz lecture. The event took place just as Germans were celebrating the 20th anniversary of the breach of the Berlin Wall. My lecture there in the heart of what had been communist East Germany was attended by many individuals who were ecstatic about their new life, political liberation and emerging consumerism. And yet there were massive migrant flows out of North Africa and Middle East arising from political alienation, political alienation across Europe and evidence of serious income and wealth inequality here at home. My talk that evening was less promising and optimistic than the general euphoria of that large audience. In fact, I offered a rather somber assessment of the new economic order. I felt like a skunk at a picnic. Over the next several years, as the refugee crisis continued, recovery from the recession was slow and ineffective and inequality persisted. Globalization had divided the world into the rich and the rest. The same split was occurring inside of individual countries. Early in 2016, an angry real estate developer and TV huckster with no experience in government became the presidential nominee of one of our major political parties. Then the British people voted to quit the European Union. Here were two surprising events that demanded diagnosis. I started work on this book in May of 2016. The diagnostician begins by advancing hypotheses, which if found plausible, might stand as explanations of reasons for the surprising events on offer. 
The more I observed the anger on display, both in the US and in Britain, the more I became convinced that the usual explanations were missing something quite important. In my exploratory work, I rediscovered a book that I had first encountered in the 1980s by the Canadian political philosopher C.B. McPherson. His book, entitled The Political Theory of Possessive Individualism, offered a vocabulary and a conceptual framework to help me understand what I was observing. From this beginning, I thought I might be able to tell a plausible story. The book is set in three parts. Part one is entitled The Problematic Triumph of Capitalism. Here I develop the conceptual framework that underpins the story I need to tell. We find in this part of the book an account of the creation of the individual as a thinking being, finally liberated from dogma and superstition that had ruled humans from the beginning of time. This mental awakening is known as the enlightenment. This newly created individual was now free to think, free to choose, but what guidance was there to help thinking. The happiness of the individual, her accomplishments and satisfactions offered a plausible substitute for customary duties and obligations. And what systematic framework offered better guidance than the emerging field of economics? Here was a framework that rendered individual happiness both measurable and morally legitimate. The discipline of economics gradually evolved to reassure us that maximizing individual happiness we call it utility, was rational. After all, the deeply religious Immanuel Kant, agonizing over the loss of sacred doctrinal truths, reassured us that morality was rational and that it was rational to be moral. As contemporary economics evolved in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and as it became increasingly preoccupied with the happiness of this created individual, the age of the possessive individual came to be seen as normal. How lucky we could now regard self-interest as moral and rational. My major claim in the book is that possessive individualism is both the effect and the cause of the gradual evolution of modern capitalism that began in the 17th century in England. This evolutionary pathway is marked by four phases the entrepreneur of merchant capitalism in the 17th century, the engineer of industrial capitalism in the 18th and 19th centuries, the banker of financial capitalism in the 20th century, and finally into what I call the wrangler of managerial capitalism that now defines the global economic system. Economic relations are now largely controlled by large corporations, Amazon, Apple, Google, Samsung, Microsoft, as well as massive hedge funds and private equity funds. I characterize this new economic landscape as one of very few hedgehogs and millions of frantic foxes. The hedgehogs of managerial capitalism know one big thing, how to make sure that nothing gets in the way of generating more income and wealth. They control global capitalism and can render workers anywhere in the world unemployed in an instant. Meanwhile, millions of isolated households have become like foxes wily scavengers constantly searching for ways to make a living. The household is on its own. Some of you are old enough to recall Margaret Thatcher's claim that there's no such thing as society. There is only the individual. The household has been cast adrift by the capitalist firm. Labor is an unwanted inconvenience. Rampant individualism is now the political spirit of our time. Ironically, precarious households are the cause of their own anger and alienation. I call it the Pogo syndrome. We've met the enemy, he's us. Part two concerns what I call the great unraveling. Here I offer a description of the economic situation in this divided world, what I call the metropolitan core and the isolated periphery. The metropolitan core is the heart of managerial capitalism. These are the rich economies of Western Europe, North America, Japan, Oceania. These are basically the members of the OECD, the rich folks. The isolated periphery is all of the rest, most of Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa. Per capita GDP in the metropolitan core is approximately $40,000 per year. In the periphery, per capita GDP is approximately $5,000. 
The richest 17% of the world's population enjoys 62% of total income. The poorest 83% of the world's population has access to just 38% of the world's income. This division is now rather locked in. With the exception of China, the divisions seem unlikely to change. Managerial capitalism has little use for the isolated periphery. Like the isolated household of the metropolitan core, the periphery is on its own. Part three of the book is called Recovering Hope. Here I offer an account of what it will look like to overcome the ravages of possessive individualism. I call this a process of recovering personhood, which is another McPherson term, personhood. The serious diagnostician comes to the task of prescribing, of offering solutions with some trepidation. I learned early in my career that people become frustrated when they read about flaws in the status quo and yet are not offered solutions. We all like answers and solutions until we hear them, at which point we don't. I've learned that as soon as the diagnostician starts to offer solutions, their actions are quick and negative. Oh, that will never work. How can you possibly suggest that? That will be quite impossible. Where did you get that crazy idea? Come on, be serious. And yet it is important to offer help. What steps might work? I offer two ideas in the book. First, I insist that we must reconstitute the private firm. Doing so will not be easy, of course. After all, the private firm is sacred in our political ideology. The firm is a job creator. But of course, when the private firm moves to China or to Mexico, therefore giving rise to stranded labor here at home, this event will be excused as being necessary if the firm is to remain competitive. Household incomes cannot be allowed to get in the way of firms remaining competitive. But the firm cannot have it both ways. It cannot be celebrated as a savior of capitalism and yet continue to behave as it has over the past several decades. That behavior meant holding wages low while corporate pay and the gifting of stock options continue at record levels. If you need a reminder of this tension, you may wish to follow the efforts of Amazon employees in Alabama who are now trying to form a union. We are told that Amazon is willing to do whatever it takes to defeat such efforts. We can be sure that it will do whatever it takes. Remember, the hedgehog knows one big thing. I insist that the private firm must be recreated as a public trust, by which I mean it must now care as much about the livelihood of its employees as it does for its shareholders, its owners. That change will not come easy. A profound mental shift is required. Actually, I argue that there's no, no such thing as the, quote, private, unquote, firm. All firms exist by virtue of a grant from the political community. If this seems surprising to you, think how difficult it would be for a heroin shop to open up in the local mall. The economy is an arena of authorized transactions and some transactions are not authorized in this particular political realm. That's why firms are a public trust. I argue that this change in how employees are treated by the firm would gradually alter the mental frame through which the working class views itself and its place in the larger political economy of contemporary capitalism. Once workers begin to realize that they are not just dispensable inconveniences, it will gradually enable them to recover some of their lost personhood. Think what a transformation it would be if firms began to offer more sick leave, paid parental leave, more paid vacation time, subsidized childcare facilities, and other innovations to make work more pleasant. In short, just imagine the transformation among workers if American firms became more like those in Denmark and Finland. It is possible after all, and it is done in virtually all of the wealthy countries. Only uniquely American style greed stands in the way. Since 1978, CEO compensation in the U.S. has risen by 940%, while compensation for the typical employee has risen by just 12%. CEO pay in America is 265 times the pay of the average worker, while in Canada, Germany, and Switzerland, this multiple averages about 145 times. 
America's CEOs pay themselves well because their boards of directors let them get away with it. Of course, there are ways to correct it. If firms refuse to change, then legislative remedies are available. Restoring the former high tax bracket, what was in place before the Reagan era, is an obvious remedy. Firms would soon realize that it makes no sense to pay executives their vast salaries if the more majority of it is going to be taxed away. Perhaps it should go workers, go to workers instead. They will spend all of it at home rather than on European vacations or timeshare condominiums in the Caribbean. The point here is that there is nothing structurally determined in capitalism that explains America's signal-minded disregard for the household. It is our version of capitalism that delivers these defective outcomes. I like to say that capitalism is like meatloaf. There are many versions. We do not need to abandon capitalism. We need to force it to be a source of good. We want better tasting meatloaf. The second reform concerns recovering our lost personhood. Doing so will require that the self-centered individual, she who flaunts her so-called rights, begins the gradual process of letting go of incessant self-regard. We have seen an abundance of such rights talk over struggles with the COVID pandemic. Sadly, our commitment to possessive individualism has authorized too many outbursts concerning the simple act of wearing a mask. Recovering personhood means recognition of our duties to others. The philosopher Josiah Royce liked to talk of loyalty, loyalty to others as equally worthy of our respect and concern. The philosopher Richard Rorty insists that morality is not the discovery of our obligation as set down, but set down by Immanuel Kant with his categorical imperative. Rather, moral progress is a gradual increase in our shared concern for the interests of a wider circle of others. Out of the increased loyalty to others will come a recreation of our lost personhood. We can defeat the poison of possessive individualism. Think of it as a new becoming. In closing, my inspiration for this process of rediscovering person, personhood is John Dewey, who talked of life as a process of trying and undergoing. I'm going to quote Dewey here very briefly. He wrote, the nature of experience can be understood only by noting that it includes an active and a passive element. On the active hand, experience is trying. On the passive hand, it is undergoing. When we experience something, we act upon it. We do something with it. Then we suffer or undergo the consequences. We do something to the thing and the thing does something to us in return. The connection of these two phases of experience measures the fruitfulness or the value of the experience. Mere activity does not constitute experience. Experience as trying involves change and change is meaningless transition unless it is consciously connected with the return wave of consequences, consequences which flow from it. When an activity is continued into the undergoing of consequences, when the change made by action is reflected back into a change made in us, the mere flux is loaded with significance. We learn something. I believe that this doing and trying and undergoing will help us overcome our crippling possessive individualism. I also believe that the world would be a much better place for this profound trying. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bromley. Uh, Professor Pennington, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Jen. And thanks, thanks Dan, for the talk. And thanks also for this really wonderfully provocative book. I'd like to start off by saying how pleased I am to be commenting on Dan's new book. As will become clear through my remarks that, that there's quite a lot in it that I take issue with. But what I really admire about the book is that it represents something I think is very important. That's an attempt to make sure that values do not disappear from economics as a discipline. I see Dan's work as part of a quest for an economics that places the ethical dimension at the heart of the subject rather than as a mere afterthought or worse still, entirely erased from view as it is in so many economics departments today. 
There are three broad interconnecting themes in Dan's book, which he's outline, outlined in his talk. First, we have a lamentation on current trends in contemporary market economies, trends that Dan and many others find worrying, wage stagnation and rising inequality, and the dissatisfaction associated with wage stagnation and rising inequality, leading to political events such as the election of Donald Trump and the Brexit vote in the UK. Second, we have a diagnosis of what lies behind these trends. A preoccupation, as Dan sees it, with an unencumbered managerial and finance capitalism sustained by an economic theory of possessive individualism. A possessive individualism which both causes the problems that Dan is concerned about, but also an individualism that permeates the culture to such an extent that it limits the extent to which solutions might actually be derived for these problems. Then third, we have a suggestion, we have suggestions for a set of reforms to the current system, which involve moving to a public trust model of the capitalist firm, where its operations are much more constrained by democratic and other collective procedures, and more broadly, where there is a shift towards institutions and values that emphasize voice, communal obligation and loyalty, and that limit or de-emphasize private property, exit, and individual rights. Now, let me start my more critical remarks with the assessment of trends in market economies. In my view, Dan's assessment is too bleak. If you properly adjust for inflation, if you recognize the increasing share of income coming from non-wage compensation, especially in the US, through items such as healthcare, if you allow for increases in purchasing power and significant improvements in the quality of many goods, then we've seen something like, depending on the estimate, a 30 to 50% increase in real incomes in the bottom part, bottom part of the income distribution in the United States since the early 1970s, and a doubling of those incomes in the UK. These are not spectacular gains by historical standards, but they do indicate steady progress, especially when you allow for the huge increase in female labor market participation and the significant absorption of immigrants into the labor market. I very much recommend Neil Gilbert's recent book, Never Enough, Capitalism and the Progressive Spirit for a good discussion of these trends. Now it's true, of course, that inequality in the US and in the UK has increased during this period. In the UK, there's not really been any change actually since the late 1990s. But some of the factors that may have contributed to this increase in inequality, such as a relative expansion in the role of globally oriented corporations and the superstar CEOs that run them, have also been factors that have led to a reduction of global inequality. The last 30 to 40 years, it should not be forgotten, have seen an unprecedented reduction of global, of global poverty. But as Branko Milanovic has also shown, the last 20 years have also seen a significant reduction of global inequality. That is partly because of what's happened in China and India, which in different ways have experimented with a controlled liberalization of their economies. But it's not only China and India, it's much of Southeast Asia and increasingly parts of Africa, though sadly not the Middle East and North Africa. If incomes are rising, if global inequality is falling, then from an ethical standpoint, how significant is a rise in inequality within the US, the UK or similar countries? And why does this equate to a crisis of capitalism? That's a question I don't think Dan fully addresses in his book. Let me move next to Dan's diagnosis. I have no problem with accepting that to a very significant extent, we do live in a world of managerial and financial capitalism. But in my view, that, that capitalism is not as footloose and fancy free as Dan suggests. First, firms do not just move to the lowest cost location. They often have reason to value an educated or well-trained workforce or to value public infrastructure. And often that doesn't always mean moving to where wages are lowest or where taxes are lowest. Second, while states don't have as much bargaining power as Dan might like them to be, 
whether individually or through blocs such as the European Union, they do have considerable bargaining power. The level of personal and corporate taxes in most developed nations has been stable or rising throughout the last 30 to 40 years. And in the UK, which I'm most, most familiar with, the tax burden is about to reach levels last seen in the late 1960s. There's also a growing burden of regulation. In the UK, the size of the financial sector relative to the economy tripled or quadrupled even since the late 1970s. But the number of financial regulators has increased 40-fold, 40-fold. So we don't live in an unencumbered market economy. And neither do I think it's plausible to suggest that the dominant economic philosophy underpinning our current model, however we describe it, is one of possessive individualism. But that philosophy permeates our cultures in the way that Dan suggests. First, the economic theory of possessive individualism or plain old neoclassical economics does not in fact favor unencumbered markets. Dominant theory emphasizes market failures into information asymmetries and externalities and downplays government failures. Rick Stroop looked at the major economics textbooks and they give one tenth of the time to government failures as they do to market failures. And these are the textbooks that educated many of those in today's economic ministries. Second, Economic theories, whether supportive of unencumbered markets or otherwise, don't have that much effect on public opinion. Most of the public don't know the arguments in favor of free markets or regulated markets. At most, they have a vague understanding of the case for competition and against monopoly. And they have a similarly vague understanding of why they might sometimes be ripped off by used car salespeople. Economic opinion is populist and arguably always has been. People on both sides of the Atlantic support minimum wages. They're skeptical of free trade and they support huge stimulus packages. If free market narratives were so culturally potent, why have they been swept away so readily since 2008 by a Keynesian tide? And if, and if possessive individualism permeates the culture to the extent Dan suggests, why in a country that, once, that was once governed by Margaret Thatcher is fully socialized medicine what we call the National Health Service, the closest thing to a national religion in the United Kingdom. Let me turn finally to Dan's proposals for reform and the philosophy that underlies them. Dan wants us to re-envisage the private firm, to move away from a model that emphasizes entrepreneurial freedom and shareholder value, to one that emphasizes communal obligations of property owners to various community stakeholders. This is a social license to operate model, and it implies higher obligations for property owners in the form of higher taxes, but also limits on the scope for en enterprises to exercise the exit option by, for example, moving overseas. But it's not only the right of exit of firms that Dan wants to limit. He also wants a more general reorientation of our political economic discourse away from individual rights and consumer choice towards more of a loyalty-based model, which replaces shopping around for the cheapest price or highest convenience with a model where people deliberate collectively about the effect of their decisions on communal values. Though Dan's account taps into a plausible longing that many people have for community, and it's one which in many ways I share, I think ultimately it's misguided because I believe that it misconstrues what the case for a property-based exit model of capitalism rests upon. The case for liberal market capitalism is not based on a possessive individualism, which assumes that the only obligations one has are to oneself. Private property and individual rights are an attempt to provide the basis for an extended form of social cooperation. They are the foundation on which obligations to others might be willingly assumed. Dan referred to Margaret Thatcher's statement about there being no such thing as society. Let me quote Margaret Thatcher in full. I recommend if you haven't read the interview in which this quote comes from, that, that you actually look it up. It's from 
an interview she gave to the Woman's Own magazine in the autumn of 1987. This is what she says. There is no such thing as society. There is a living tapestry of men and women and people. And the beauty of that tapestry and the quality of our lives will depend upon how much each of us is prepared to take responsibility for ourselves and each of us prepared to turn around and help by our own efforts, those who are unfortunate. On the liberal view that I would defend, the tapestry that Mrs. Thatcher referred to will not be created if you start by expecting people to agree on too much, not only with respect to their personal needs and preferences, but also with respect to their other regarding or communal values, the cultural, aesthetic and religious codes they may wish to live by. It is true that the legal obligations that liberal capitalism entails are thin or contractual in nature. But that is because if people were legally required to do more for their trading partners, employees, or others in the community, then they might not enter such relationships in the first place. Precisely because property rights limit legal obligations to others, they increase people's willingness to cooperate with those who are different from themselves, different in terms of race, religion, and other aspects of identity. Now, of course, what Joseph Schumpeter called the capitalist gale of creative destruction can be very disruptive to communities. But what needs to be recognized is that A, many of those communities would not have existed were it not for the way that contracts and property and trade bring diverse peoples together. And B, the conditions under which new communities can form and reform are also created by the gale of creative destruction. Think of the women in Southeast Asia who having been employed by global corporations have found an existence outside of domestic labor, which is enabling them to renegotiate relationships with their husbands and with their communities. People want community and they find multiple ways to create it within the inter interstices of a market economy. But on the liberal view that I defend, the search for community should not extend to the institutional framework of society itself. Though it can never be entirely neutral, the constitutional framework should strive towards neutrality. It can provide and should provide some genuinely public goods and even something like a basic income to cushion people from the effects of change. But the compulsory requirement to support others or to involve them in decisions about the use of property should be limited. If you want to see the effects that pushing collective burdens too far in a context where there isn't one monolithic notion of community present, then look no further than to Denmark or to Sweden, two of the countries that Dan singles out as being role models that the US should try to emulate. Sweden pursued a liberal immigration regime admirably so for many years, but now is increasingly turning its back on that history because the majority population do not want to pay welfare entitlements to the large numbers of unemployed immigrants, many who, who do not share their values and who live in increasingly ghettoized suburban estates. Denmark has never been as liberal on immigration as Sweden, but it is now moving towards even more stringent controls just this week, the Social Democratic Administration in Denmark, I repeat, the Social Democratic Administration, proposed a new law which will place an upper limit of 30% on the immigrant population. And by that, you can read the non-white population that may reside within any given district. I think the lesson is clear. If we seek a society that is a rich tapestry of different individuals, communities, and cultures, then the legal obligations that we owe to others must be limited. And that requires a constitutional framework that protects property and the right of exit. It is on that limited legal foundation that other obligations to other people might willingly be assumed. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Um, I know, uh, Dan, I don't know if you, you don't want to respond. We'll just throw things open. No, let's, let's do questions. Okay, perfect. So I actually, I want to, to, to take uh, the prerogative and ask a, a simple question here. Uh, you know, the, the book to me was striking in so many ways. This, you know, I'd encourage all of you to read it because it's profound and it deals with such big questions. And I think, you know, for many of us grappling with these issues, we get stuck in our very little questions. And it's just so refreshing to find a book that takes on the big ideas. And one of the ideas that is really central here, that's really driving, I think, so many of the mechanisms um, that lead to this sort of dysfunctional outcome is the process of alienation. And Dan, you talk quite a lot about alienation in the book. And alienation comes really, it's, it, you, you talk about it as being a men's problem, right? That men who don't have access to jobs, who cannot provide for their families, this leads to really deep uh, despair. But in many of the contexts where I work, I see sort of a different dynamic happening. That this is alienation that tends to be driven by the example set by those who are in power. And those are primarily those who are in political power. And those are the dynamics of corruption, dynamics of predation, the feeling that the people who are supposed to be protecting you, namely the state, the people who you think that you can turn to when it most matters are the ones who completely rob you of your dignity. And to me, if we look around the world and we see the, the protests that are happening in the protest society, I would diagnose things in a slightly different way. That there really is this revolt of the public that's sort of uh, more visible to people through social media, through all of these other dynamics. We have so much more information. It's much more easy for us to lose trust, both in corporations, in the private sector, as well as our public sector leaders. So what I see is, is deep alienation coming from institutions of all varieties. I don't know how you'd respond. Good. Should I respond? Yeah. <clears throat> I, um, the term alienation requires a little bit of deconstruction. I, I, I think I see how you're using alienation. I use it in, in, in a Marxian psychological sense of the inability of the individual to place herself in the world in which she finds herself. I mean, that was, we think of alienation as anger. Psychologists treat alienation as the inability of the individual to make sense of the world in which she now is embedded. So it's, it's a displacement, it's a cognitive dissonance sort of thing. Uh, and my sense, Jen, is that you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and I think what, and I, I think this relates to, to Mark's concern too. Uh, as I say in the book, the Enlightenment gave us, created us as thinking beings. And we are not yet able to think our way through the situation in which the world now presents to us in many, many ways, whether it's in the north of England or whether it's in rural America or whether it's in Afghanistan, the, 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 our, our institutional capacity for governance, for dealing with people cannot keep up with the awareness and the self image that the, that the created individual now has. And so it is no wonder that we look around the world and everywhere we look, there's a problem going on. And I offered one kind of diagnosis of that problem. Mark has a very different take. That's great. We st I still don't think we know, Jen. So it's, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering you, but in a sense, I, I say, no wonder there's so much alienation in the world. The world is a really awful place, awful in the sense of fit and so on. And so I don't mean awful in the sense that Mark would object to, but the world is a, is a heck of a place, isn't it? because we've now created the individual to think for herself and everywhere she looks or he looks, he finds a problem. And 
I don't like Mark's answer. He doesn't like my answer or his solution, my solution. But I think that's what we're facing, Jen. We're still living out the entailments of the enlightenment and, and we're not smart enough. Our political capacity is not smart enough to reckon with all of that dissonance that's going on. Have I responded, Jen? You have. Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, I mean, I, I think I would add that I think there is a, a sense of alienation of large parts of the population um, from elites. There's no doubt about that. I, I, I agree with that very much. And I think that's what explains Donald Trump. I think it's what explains the Brexit vote. But I, and this is probably reflecting my ideological biases, I think that is a lot to do with the fact that people feel that elites don't share their values. So I grew up in the north of England. I grew up in a, in a town called Wigan, um, which is the, the place George Orwell wrote, wrote about, the, the road uh, from Wigan Pier. It's an old textile town, mining town, jobs decimated in the 1980s, all of those stories. The people in that town, I don't think particularly object to the idea of having to adapt to you know, the ravages of global capitalism, however you want to describe it. But what they do object to, and I think this is what drove many of them to vote for Brexit, did, was the sense that the elites, the people who run the country, the people who run financial institutions, the European Union, actually detest their values, which are broadly speaking, culturally conservative values. Now, I'm not a cultural conservative, I'm a, I'm a cosmopolitan, but lots of people in the the elite who are cosmopolitans like me, give the impression of really having no sympathy at all with the kind of value system that other people have. And that's a huge problem. And I don't know how that can be overcome. Could I, could I reinterpret your, what you just expressed, Mark? My answer, my, my hypothesis would be, it's not that the, the, the uh, shall we call them the alienated folks. My sense is they look to the elites for answers. I don't think their, their frustration comes from the fact that they don't think the elites understand them. They look to the elites for answers to their alienation, to their material deprivation, and they don't see the elites offering it. And that's very different. It's, it's not that they think the elites don't share their values or what have you. We are, and I think this explains why we see the rise of strong men, if I can use that term, uh, Strong men who say, trust me, I can fix your problems. Why are those kind of tropes so compelling to the people who feel disenfranchised? They are compelling because we still as humans look to somebody to provide answers, whether it's a father figure or a big man in the village or whatever. And we don't see it coming from the elites. And then there, if, if, if I can extend it then, if we don't see that answer coming from the elites, and the elites don't have an answer to the dilemma, partly because, as I say in my book, the elites have been socialized and educated into a mindset that you don't need to solve these problems because the market will take care of everything. Just let the market work it out. So that's my take on this elite, uh, rural alienated guy up in the north of England or out in the center of Nebraska. It's not so much values is that the elites don't have an answer. Jen, go ahead. I... Yes, thank you. No, uh, in, in the example that I had in my mind were sort of the Pashtuns fighting against the central government in Afghanistan is something that's, that's quite perplexing. Um, we have a question here about inequality. And a question says, my understanding is that on most measures, poverty and inequality are still falling substantially worldwide and comparing households. And this gets to Mark's point. So even if inequality within countries increasing is increasing a bit, is this decrease in poverty and inequality not something to celebrate? Dan, I think that's directed to you. Sure, we should celebrate every decrease in inequality. I'm for celebrations every place I find it. Uh, the, the question is, I find inequality, while I've used it, I find inequality as, as kind of a slippery sort of idea. Mark did notice that a lot of sort of global measures of inequality have shown improvements because China has sort of promised and delivered some goods to a number of people who very much needed it. Uh, 
whether that's an ultimate solution or not, I don't really know. Uh, I, uh, I don't know how I feel about analyzing inequality because even though I, I use it as a source of value, it seems to me that inequality, the only thing that matters about inequality is can I provide my children with the kind of livelihood that I experienced and so on. And so if, if that's a measure of alienation and concern and, and political anger across the landscape, then that, that cuts across the entire globe. And in a sense, that's a race you can never win because in a sense, our hopes for improved livelihoods will always be in terms of, are my children able to do better than I did. So let me let me stop there. Of course, we should celebrate declining inequality. I spent a lot of my time working in East Africa. I'm advising the government of South Sudan, and uh, I worked a lot in other parts of Africa. And I look around for evidence of improved livelihoods that I hear so much about by people who haven't spent nearly as much time out in the bush in Africa as I have spent. I spent a lot of my time in South Africa. A lot of my time in West Africa, now in Sudan, South Sudan. Where is all this disappearing inequality that I hear about? Come with me sometime. I'll take you on a trip through South Sudan and you will be shocked. That's what I say to people who say, oh, Africa's rising. Oh, really? Great. Mark, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I think um, on the Africa point, I think it's a my sense is it's a very mixed picture. Um, sure, I know um, I was looking at some figures the other day that uh, William Easterly quoted, um, and he's someone who's actually been very critical of, um, you know, some of the World Bank type programs. Um, and he was saying that the growth trajectory in many African countries is now above what it has been through much of the post-war period. Sure. How that translates on the ground I'm not in a position to answer that question. And Very I quick. think that's- You're right, Bill Easterly, I, I trust Bill Easterly's number. He knows what he's talking about. We must understand there are three or four different Africas. And, and one yeah, of the precisely. very obvious places of quote growth is those African countries that happen to have oil. I'm not interested in counting GDP growth from the export of oil. So that yeah. takes about eight countries off of, off of the, the table immediately. So that's where the data are really problematic, but I don't think we should spend too much time talking about Africa. I, Jen, there are, must be other questions that you have. Yeah, so a, a question for, for, uh, for Mark. Uh, you made an interesting point about the growth of the size of the financial sector, uh, which uh, this person sees is very much correlated with the abandonment of any tie between national currencies and gold, as well as with huge increases in income and wealth inequality. However, it seems that those who most decry inequality rarely talk about the role of central banks in creating it. Why is that? Well, <laughs> I don't have an answer to that question. Come on, Mark. Um, <laughs> I don't either, I, but I thought you would. <laughs> I, I, I don't. Um, I mean, I think there, there is a very serious argument to say, and it, it's one that I would have a lot of sympathy with, especially after the, the financial crisis, that the financial sector, um, even though it is more heavily regulated than I think that many people recognize, is structurally privileged within the political economy, that um, finance uh, firms, central banks, um, people in the stock market have an influence on policy that enables them to reproduce some of their advantages. Um, now, you know, what you do to, to address that, I think you, you talk about potentially fundamental reforms of the way finance is regulated. I suspect my kind of solution to that problem would be different to, I don't know about Dan's, but certainly to some of the other people that I've heard talking about those kind of reforms. Um, but I would also say you shouldn't exaggerate some of these trends either. So I do repeat, if you look at the UK case, the rise in inequality um, that has happened in the UK, most of it occurred between 1986 and the mid 1990s. If you look at the trend since the mid 1990s onwards in the UK, and that's included the financial crash um, and the various uh, financial 
packages that have, have arisen since then. The inequality level has actually been fairly stable. And in fact, during the last um, sort of downturn uh, was declining. So I don't think the, the picture of constantly rising inequality um, is, is not a strictly accurate one. Go ahead. Jen, can I kind of come into here a little bit? And I, I, don't, I don't know that I want to say too much about the central bank, but I think this, this, whole, this whole idea of, of inequality, I believe, warrants a little more talk. It's my understanding that the, that the typical Trump voter in America has a, has a per capita income that, or a household income that is very close to the median of, of the country as a whole. Okay, So what we see is the perception that it would be the really poor who are angry at the system. But in fact, the, the, most of the anger at our system comes out of people with household incomes in the neighborhood of fifty, fifty-five thousand dollars a year. The poor are silent. Okay, the poor are not out there. So when we start talking about inequality and so on and alienation, I think we want to be clear where that alienation is coming from, what the socioeconomic categories are that articulate that alienation. They're the ones. So that's part of it. Central banks influence inequality by focus on interest rates, by focus on inflation, and that affects different people different different ways. Anyway, that's okay. We have another question from Ilya Murtazashvili, who uh, is on daddy duty today, and he says <laughs> that he has a, a question he's always had for Dan. Shouldn't we give possessive individualism some credit for contributing to the escape from the Malthusian trap and enabling us to redistribute wealth? Give possessive individualism credit for escaping the Malthusian trap. Is this the question? Yes, which then enables wealth redistribution. Which then enables wealth distribution. I see. Um, well, there's a difference between individualism and possessive individualism. Individualism, I think by the question, the individualism, oh, sort of we want to unleash the eagerness of, of each individual, you know, to sort of work hard and, and get up early and, and do all those great things that brought great wealth, which then enable us to uh, succeed, grow, and then perhaps redistribute later. Maybe that's what the question has in mind. Uh, no one, me included, ever wishes to put down individual initiative. Let's be clear about this. I regard possessive individualism as the end result of a set of, of cultural practices that now imperil the very kind of thing that I think the questioner wants to stimulate and to enable. Possessive individualism to me is, is a defensive crouch. Possessive individualism is, in a sense, is I now have mine, leave me alone. So I, I there's a, a to, I'm repeating myself. The energy of the, unleashing the energies of the individual, which was what the, the we might say the uh, sort of the industrial revolution was all about, of course, created enormous wealth. And now I think we're kind of in the in the backwash of that, in which possessive individualism is a corrosive impediment to the very kinds of improvements that I think we need. I think it is, as I say in the book, the possessive individual is the unwitting engine of her own disempowerment. She is the unwitting cause of her anxiety because of the cultural attributes that she's taken on board and now is imperiled by those. It prevents us from breaking out of the trap. That's basically, I think, the message of, of the book. Great. Um, Mark, I don't know if you want to add to that. Um, I, don't, I don't really have anything to add on that specifically, but I think it would be interesting to, to think about, and this is why I raised at the end of my remarks, what's going on in the Scandinavian countries. The issue of how you have a society which is economically and culturally pluralistic, you know, how far that is possible. I, I am a cosmopolitan. I, I, I value diversity, all those sorts of things. I support free movement of people. But if that is combined um, 
with heavy notions of redistribution, as it is in Scandinavia. You have a pushback against it. You see this in France as well, um, where you have this kind of generalization of sections of the population that are not integrated into the labor market because they are quite regulated labor markets, but also where uh, there's sort of cultural pushback because there's a sense in which the values aren't compatible. Now, I, I believe people can get on together, <laughs> um, but, but these are questions, it seems to me, that, that do have to be addressed. They do. And I think that, that what we have mixed together here, and, you, and, and I understand your point about Sweden and Denmark sort of pulling up the ladder to the lifeboat or whatever it is, you know, yeah. we have economic systems, state-based, nation-based economic systems that are intended to solve their own problems and organize things. That's what states are, isn't it? That's what governance is all about. And then for some reason they are expected, and I don't wish to sound cruel in what I'm about to say, but then they are somehow expected to take on the failures of, of uh, provisioning systems elsewhere, whether those pr failed provisioning systems are in Syria or in Guatemala or, or Mali or you name it, okay? And so, Somehow, the, our, our struggle with you know, governance and markets and how can we make them work, that's hard enough without this other, in, and I, I wanna be really careful how I talk about this because people get angry and say, Am I anti, I'm anti-immigrant or something. That's not the point. We must be honest about then how these, these struggling states, whether they're Denmark or the US or the UK, how they take on that other burden. And I think Mark, as you know very well, the Brexit fight, I mean, there's a way to control immigrants into the UK coming from Syria. There was no way to control immigrants to the UK coming in from Poland, the Polish plumber, right? I mean, that's where a lot of the anxiety in the North of England came from, wasn't it? Immigration from within a community called the European Union. That created much of the anger about Brexit, didn't it? It wasn't dark-skinned people coming from Africa, it was Eastern Europeans wanting to be a plumber in England. I, I think the evidence, I'm actually not sure about that. I, th I think there's something in that. Um, but I also think if you look to what happened in the, in the referendum campaign, one of the key moments is when the, you know, the Nigel Farage, who was involved in the, the UK Independence Party, raised the prospect quite deliberately of Turkey entering the European Union so that it would be an issue of basically Islamic immigration into the UK. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure actually, you know, there isn't um, community discord between Poles and people in the North of England. Yeah. Uh, maybe there are concerns about the effects on wages at the lower end of the market, yeah. but um, I I'm not so sure what the key driver was there. I mean, the problem in Britain is that Brexit has dominated so much of the debate for the last five years, and nobody really has a clue what happened. What did Other we do and why, right? <laughs> yeah. Why did we do that? I forgot. I don't so I'm going to wrap things up with, with one final question. And, and Dan, this actually comes from your own book. And to me, it was one of the most meaningful um, pieces uh, that I read uh, from the book, you write at the end of the very first chapter um, in this reflection section, you say that in today's fraught political and economic climate, it seems the world is full of people, <clears throat> excuse me, who are seldom right, but never in doubt. Doubt is the first step in the quest for reasons. Good reasons defeat doubt. As you've, this is really powerful and I just, I love this line. Um, because it builds on, you know, so many traditions that you've built upon in your work and that I've benefited from for so many years. Um, and I think so many of us have. And as you have, you know, finished this book, as you put it away, is there something about this piece? This is a very imp impolitic question to ask, though, that gives you doubt. As you've written this book, as you've put it away, what gives you doubt? It's written with such certainty. Good reasons defeat doubt. You've given many reasons. But are there areas here that you doubt? Areas in the book that I doubt. 
So that's a question. Do I now have doubt? Of course I have doubt. I doubt if I did a good enough job. I doubt if I was clear. And then I listened to Mark and I doubt if I, if I made my arguments clear, not because I disagree with what he said, but if I, if I, if I wasn't clear enough to head off the kinds of things that Mark brought up, then it's a defective product. And I, that's why I, you never want to have a, a, a person who loves you review your work. You want to have somebody just hammer the heck out of you because then you say, aha, I didn't make that clear. So of course I have doubt. Every, it's like raising children. You finish with this product and you look at them and say, uh, right? So I, I, you'd like to do stuff. Would I write this book again? Of course not. But I'd write a sequel to it in which I would take on Mark and 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 try to confront the very nice comments or the you know the perceptive comments that Mark made. He's wrong on most of them, but this is not the place for that. So on that what, note, what answer you, Jen? Is that what you mean? By that? I was I yes, I was looking just for a figment of doubt. Mark, um, Mark should get a chance to tell me you know that I was mistaken in calling him wrong. But anyway, it's all in good faith. I loved his comments. Absolutely, that's why we do this. It's really yeah. important to us to do this. <laughs> um, echo chambers, who has time? Yeah. Uh, so, so I just wanna thank you, Dan, for taking the time to share this book with us. I'd encourage everyone who's with us uh, to pick it up and to read it. Uh, whether you agree or disagree, it is just so much wonderful food for thought here, especially the discussion of pragmatism. And if you've never been exposed to Dan's work on pragmatism and volitional pragmatism, um, he delves into those 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 issues as well. Uh, Mark, enormous thanks to you for these extraordinary comments. Um, really just grateful for the, the time and care that you put into them and to our audience for the excellent questions. And Dan, we are very much looking forward to the sequel. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.